Hi everyone, I'm Anastasia Glebova, CEO and co-founder of CB Art, online platform to exhibit, sell and collect digital art. And we are so proud to present our art space project and to have a great artist talk, which is to be featured today with some participants of the art spaceship. Uh, and we are glad to present it on the CADAV, so uh, the biggest global crypto and digital art fair from 17th to 23rd of June. And I'm looking forward to, to the today's discussion because this project uh, means a lot uh, to everybody out of our team and of course to artists who are participating, I hope so, uh, because it emphasizes uh, how art can be connecting people instead of uh, actually tearing them apart. And how even in this complicated time as a pandemic, uh, which was of course the rise of the digital arts uh, because of the uh, transition to the digital art life lifestyle, if I may say so, uh, but anyways, uh, it showcases how the art can uh, kind of coexist in the future and how the artists from different countries, from all the continents can work together and find a new inspiration in the space theme. So I hope that you will enjoy the today's conversation and I'm glad to present Gregory uh, Ibazov, who is also a Chief Communication Officer at VART, who will be our amazing virtual host for today and looking forward to the today's discussion. Have Thanks a lot, Anastasia. Um, well, hello there, everybody. It is a pleasure to welcome you here today at this artist talk uh, recorded by VR for the Cut Affair. Um, my name is Greg Ivazov. I'll be your host for the duration of the talk. Uh, we hope you have been having a great experience at the fair so far and that it will get even better as time goes on and you encounter more amazing art. Today, I'm glad to introduce you to some of the most exciting artists and artworks featured at the VR booth at Cardiff Online. Uh, together, these artists are featured in a single exhibition called the Art Spaceship. The Art Spaceship is the very first space art center designed by a space architect, previously working at the European Space Agency, featuring international projects that expand the horizons of art. You can find this exhibition at VR's website if you're curious to look more. Today, we're joined by nine amazing artists from this exhibition. These artists from diverse regions from North America to China raise the topics of space exploration, humanity, new technologies, memory, beauty, the future, um, and many more through diverse digital artworks, which you can find at the fair. Now, without further ado, allow me to proceed to interview uh, some of these innovative and intriguing artists. Um, so, Samer, why don't we start with you? Um, could you please briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Well, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm, my name is Samer Sayeri. I'm a pro assistant professor of architecture, a scientist, a researcher, and working for 20 years on digital art, 20, 22 years exactly. So uh, with digital art, I became award-winning for over 39 awards, international and national awards. And it's like the main part of my life is the digital art. I hope that makes it. Thanks very much, Samer. Um, and Samer, to elaborate a little bit more about your background, someone looking over your CV for the first time might be forgiven for wondering how an architect ended up participating at the crypto and digital art fair. So. If you could, could you please elaborate on how you combine your architectural practice and education with an artistic one and why you rely on the digital medium so much? Thank you, Gregory. It's a very important question, really, not only for me, but for all of the architects and all of the audience to just clarify what is architecture and where it lies in art. First of all, let me define architecture. Architecture as defined in, in, in all, most of the dictionaries, I can say the Oxford, the Mary Webster, it is the combination of art and science of an art and science of constructing buildings. So the the fifty percent of architecture is art, and maybe more in some of, of the uh, of our projects. Also, the old saying that calls that there is seven kind of arts. The architecture is the second or the first, even in in some uh, books, the first kind of art or the second part of art. Third saying is uh, by a very famous architect, Frank Rudoid. He's one of the uh, iconic architects of the American architecture. He called that the architecture is mother of all arts. Why is that quote important? That quote is important because art lies in architecture in two different ways. The architecture itself is a formation that expresses art. 
And the second part is architecture carries inside it, mostly all kinds of arts. You can find an architecture painting, you can find plastic arts, you can find sculpture, you can find even new virtual reality, even the new kind of art, media arts, digital arts, everything are within the, the architecture itself. So the architecture is a pure reflection of art. And in our uh, point of view, in our uh, uh, perception, art is, is the container that can express our old values, our current and contemporary ideals and our future aspirations. So it expresses our past, our present and our future. And architecture merely achieves the same. It's expression. We, we have learned from ancient civilizations, from Greeks, from Romans, from ancient Egyptian pharaohs, that we, we, we knew a lot about their lifestyles, their sciences, their knowledge, their uh, history through art. I mean, the wall murals that were drawn on the architectural constructions have given a very good and clar clarified the image about how they these, these folks lived in some days. So architecture, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is the container of the of the uh, human culture. And it is a, we, we do not construct buildings. This is, this is the wrong idea about architects. We create lifestyles. We create containers for the human activity. And the novelty at the top of the mountain of the novelty of the human activity is art. So this, this is the relation between architecture and art. For the second question, which I find is much more interesting, why digital art? Well, let me let me clarify a little bit about what I'm doing. I'm I'm working on digital art and mostly in the 3D or what they can call the virtual environments or the cyberspace. Cyberspace or virtual environments or the 3D kind of art. All of these are just names for the same thing. What is digital art in our perception, my perception? The digital art or the 3D art, it is a hyperdimensional media. It's an open dimensional media. Let's first agree upon what is dimension. Dimension is the degree of freedom. When I work on a two-dimension media, when I just draw a sketch, I'm working on a two-dimensional media. When I'm making a physical model or a sculpture, I'm working in a three-dimensional media. But when I'm working on a 3D environment or a digital media, it's a hyper-dimensional. I can go through the time. I can define my own gravity instead of below gravity. I can, it might be a lateral gravity. It might be an upward gravity. I can create my own rules and my own physics. And hence, and, and we do that, by the way, in, in testing our architecture concepts, our notions, our beliefs, we create our own phenomena. We create our own wind, our own magnets, our own physics, our own science. We test science and art on the same platform. And this is what is interesting in the creation process. The other interesting part is the documentation process. You see, we have also learned from the ancient civilization that passed their architecture for thousands of years about their cultural heritage and their legacy. And I do believe that the digital media and especially NFT, it, it's, it's, it's a timeless, time stops there. You can pass your legacy to thousands of years. As long as the humanity exists, the digital media and the digital files will exist. You can pass all of your uh, creations to the future generations, to the others. Uh, digital art can really cross the boundaries, the culture, the countries. And the same applies for the NFT. You can, with the NFT also passes not only your uh, cultural product, but the ownership and the realities accompanying this cultural world for thousands of years. So it is a new media. From the very early beginnings of the mankind who used the just a stone or a piece of chalk and start drawing on walls. And now after three and a half million years, according to anthropologists, and we do exist, we are just upgrading our tools. But the art exists inside us, not in the moon. We are updating and we are upgrading, we are evolving with the new tools. So I hope that also have answered your question. Thank you. Absolutely, Samir. Thanks very much. It's very eloquent and important points, all of them. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we'll make sure to come back to these later on. Um, Milos, why don't you go next? Uh, do you mind introducing yourself briefly, please? Yes, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Milos Peskir. Uh, audio visual art is a field of my interest. I'm mostly creating the moving image in digital uh, media, uh, sound image processing, and the generative uh, combined. Uh, this uh, piece, uh, digital fossil corrupt Galatian, uh, represents the uh, subversive uh, 
reaction on questioning of uh, the heritage of the digital, the digital era. Uh, so in, in a sense, it's a uh, it's continuation of, of what Summer was talking about, and, uh, uh, what will be the trace of our time or what is a physical document that we left behind what kind of material document uh, we produce in uh, non-material media. Uh, also, corrupt Galatian uh, is uh, used as a metaphor for uh, physical fragility of uh, digital material and uh, of human uh, perceptive adaptation. Thanks very much, Milos. Um, Milos, you have been involved in intermedia, let's say, in the digital art scene for quite some time. Um, the nature of this medium is such that the possibilities that it offers for creation constantly change. So what I'm wondering is, how has your art been changed by the evolution of the digital medium itself? Yes, I, I have started creating in digital media in early uh, 2000s. Uh, since then, technological development brought a huge impact uh, on the uh, social sphere and uh, seriously changed the um, uh, global culture. Uh, but uh, that, that brought a kind of feedback. It made uh, probably expected, but for sure, a complex development uh, of the medium, of, of the digital medium. Uh, my artistic urge hasn't changed much, but uh, the, the ways of uh, exp expression uh, has changed a lot uh, since uh, my focus was always uh, on uh, media itself, the nature of, of the media itself. Uh, so beside, uh, beside uh, developing the, the, the skills on tools, uh, my, my subject is changing its axis uh, very fast in these days. Thanks very much, Milos. Um, it's a pleasure to have you on board, uh, considering your wealth of experience and talents. Um, with this in mind, I'd like to uh, proceed to Citron and Lonardi. Uh, so if you guys would like to introduce yourself briefly, now's the time. Okay, uh, I am Luca Lonardi, and she is a Silene Citron. Uh, Citron Lonardi is a collaboration uh, born in uh, 2014 between two different personalities. Uh, Citron, uh, who passing from digital fabrication to performance. And uh, I, uh, look at that, I, uh, I work with video and writing. She is uh, a performer and a sculptor. Uh, her current artist uh, work focuses on digital fabrication and uh, 3D printing. Um, uh, I am a filmmaker specialized in uh, scientific communication and uh, documentary. Um, my, um, in our practice, uh, we use technology as an instrument to reconnect the human experience uh, with the natural world, uh, unifying design, audiovisual arts, and the scientific uh, research. Uh, in fact, our works are uh, hybrid creatures uh, in which they combine elements of the natural world, such as biology, uh, with elements of the artificial world, like uh, digital fabrication. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure to, to have you with us. Uh, Citron, you. Lunardi, as an artist duo, I wonder if you can tell our audience a little more about how you split responsibilities in between each other and how you work together. Uh, we immediately uh, agreed that our works uh, together are to be born from the desire to contaminate our previous experiences and the new interests to create something hybrid and infected by the suggestions of Bath. 
Uh, often our works arise from a very urgent suggestion of the society's problems. For example, our recent research and artistic creation focuses on the political and aesthetic implication of non-anthropocentrism, an interest of Bach. And scientists, uh, and sometimes this interest becomes a suggestion, an image, and then an artifact created by Citron, and sometimes uh, a performance. At this point, the object um, or uh, the perform performative act becomes a subject that height uh, develops in a film language. The final pr product uh, comes from a continuous work of adaptation and contamination. Uh, our work process is also, as, uh, is also a hybrid as hybrids are our works. Thanks very much. That's quite an eloquent description. Uh, it's once again very good to, to have you with us on the Art Spaceship and at the fair. Um, and with this, I'd like to move on to Arthur. Arthur, if you'd like to introduce yourself now is the time. Sure. This is one of those standard questions that required a more interesting answer than the question itself. Uh, first of all, I always think uh, it's more important to say what you have been rather than what you are, because um, I'm constantly developing and I could say I'm this or that, but uh, I've been a classical flutist playing, you know, Mozart and Mozart stuff and all of that. I have been a composer. I have uh, done art installations. I've done sound art. I've done experience design, event management. I've designed and executed festivals around the world. And I've, of course, created arts in different genres. Uh, but the kind of a small analogy, in the 90s, I was working in Amsterdam Stein, which is a place where you design instruments. And I met Laurie Anderson there. And uh, she said to me, well, what were you doing? And I explained it to her in the geekiest language as I could. But she said, you know, I can't even put my stereo together. And what was really important, that whole conversation I had with her, is that it's very important to choose a title that you can kind of evolve in. So I would say that I'm a media artist. And I wouldn't say I'm a digital artist because who knows what quantum physics is going to bring. Digital may be out. But uh, that's what I think is really important. So um, to create a kind of a system which you can run wild in and, and reinvent yourself over the time span that you're on Earth. I guess that's the, my answer to the 30 second question. <laughs> Thanks very much, Arthur. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, Arthur, to elaborate a little bit more about who you are. Um, we know that you combine and reconcile um, your roles as a director of a virtual art festival and your uh, creative artistic practice. So I wonder if you can tell our audience a little bit more about how you managed to do that and what motivates you to reconcile the two. Okay, sure. Um, first of all, I don't think there's any need to reconcile anything. There might be a lot of fighting about what is a curator, what is an artist, what is a director, what is an administrator, but all of that is predefined before you're born, so you can reject it all in the idea that you're a creative being and you can just move through these roles as you want. Uh, now, what's really important is you have to know your roles, know your limits, and know yourself. And But there's a particular philosophy behind it. And I think there's a couple of facts we kind of have to all recognize. And I've been in the arts for a long time. And that if we take uh, the most successful artists are trust funders. That means they're kiddies with money in the background, so they don't have to make a living. So, And uh, that's a bit of a of a, a kind of, yeah, maybe a, a problem for many people because there's many artists who have to struggle. So the idea was that since artists are creative and they can reinvent things, would be able to provide a kind of new roles for artists who, who were actually in need of funding and in need of... Uh, uh, a way to make a living to to create their work. So I I kind of invent this idea that uh, of role mixing. So the idea I was asked for an example, I would ask an artist who I thought was quite good to pick an artwork and a subject which was related to it in terms of research or, and then to reach out to other artists that were um, doing something similar and then combine it into a show. And I would then push the, push the strings and pull the wires so that they could get it into a major museum somewhere around the world. And in this way, they were paid as curators and administrators, but also they could focus on an artwork that was very important to them and have it kind of the important aspects of it articulated by the other works in the show and vice versa. So um, 
what's important to notice through this combination of roles is that you're able to diversify your network, right? And at one point, all that diversification comes together, right? And so um, the thing is, you get your works into important venues and to a broader audience because you're at the top of the food chain, okay? So, and you're also able to um, do things that artists aren't particularly able to do unless they're in large teams, which you would have to be extremely successful to do. So if you think of a festival as a platform to do research, then you are actually very free to introduce other institutions like ATH Zurich, University of Zurich, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of do that research on the fly within the context of the arts. Okay, so you're, ex you're, ex broad you're broadening your whole abilities as an artist to do research and to present that research as an artwork. So you're pulling the technology out of the black box and you're actually expanding your technical uh, um, vocabulary through new technologies. So um, it gives you the opportunity also to work with institutions which will develop tools for you and, and you'll be able to develop the technology uh, that you're, you wanted to use or never dreamed of using. And so also through ex broadening your network and um, you also get teaching opportunities, publishing offers. And you simply also, what's really important to know is that um, artists don't have much contact with politicians unless they're really up the line. But if you're organizing a festival which involves major institutions of a country, you're automatically confronted with ambassadors and science officers from different uh, uh, country. So the most powerful chess move is naturally the queen and then the castle or something, combination like that. But in the arts, it's an ambassador and an artist because the ambassador can pull the political side of it and you can do the creative side. So by simply gaining political support, you're able to push through walls and doors that are always going to be closed to you unless you have uh, some other major factor behind you. So it's the combination of the roles and how they're kind of distributed and how they synergize together with factors outside of the arts within on the platform of the festival itself. So it's really a breeding ground for the new, for the innovative. It's a very inspiring vision uh, that you have uh, outlined, I may say. <laughs> yeah, the fact that we're all more, the fact that perhaps we're all capable of more than we uh, perceive and the fact that uh, sort of multifunctionality is something that we can all do and um, really quite inspiring so thanks very much for laying that out arthur um sure. alexandra uh we move on to you next uh if you could please uh, say a few words about yourself yes uh, <clears throat> oh thank you very much i'm very happy being with you so my name is alexandra dementiva i'm a digital artist like a uh, media artist and i'm already started it's already very earlier because uh, when i began it was something that's 92 93 i was just uh, did every uh, things myself so it means that i just taken some detector normally this is light movement detector and trying to integrate it in some sort of strange program that at that time already existed like apple tools so just really the beginning of the beginning and uh, later, I, I was not really, I didn't have any contact with people who are doing something in digital world well, except doing video. Also, it was not really so developed, but it was okay. So uh, I uh, start trying to find somebody, some sort of the alien, uh, not alien, but somebody alias in um, Belgium. And uh, we founded Imal organization, several artists who wanted to make a practice in digital so it was in 2000 only and uh, since then i continue to uh, produce different pieces in video in the interactive design things just but always i'm trying to have it like a, some kinds of the physical world links to the digital world because for me it's interesting this connection between these two and uh, also sometimes i'm giving different kinds of workshop and teaching so this is small <laughs> introduction it really is quite difficult to sum it all up in, in 30 seconds, but thanks very much, Alexandra. Um, perhaps to elaborate a little bit more on your background. Um, Alexandra, is it fair to say that your artistic practice uh, sort of actively integrates and perhaps interacts with fields such as social psychology, mass behavior and culture? And so assuming that it is, uh, what is it like to work with and use complex and abstract ideas as sort of inspirations for for your art? Well, uh, 
if already take uh, the just start from the beginning because all kinds of the things like science, art, uh, architecture, well, just because architecture is part of, uh, but at the same time, so it's also part of the construction and uh, I don't know, philosophy. This is everything. This is anthropological practice that gives us possibility to study, to learn about reality around us. So it means that uh, when I am trying to integrate in my project, uh, and this is also why I start to do interactive installation, like uh, behavior, social psychology, how people react and interact with each other and interact with the object. This is, was already something that inspired me to go to the digital art. And after I'm combining, because for me, it's also a very interesting, uh, not really answering question because sometimes I don't have any answer for what I would like to ask, but uh, to uh, put this question on uh, for public and uh, make them interact and just uh, uh, trigger some thinking about because it's uh, I think it's very important that people more or less uh, make attention for things is what how it's happening and what is happening and. Uh, uh, it also uh, gives me possibility to uh, work with the different kinds of the shapes, form, sculpture, and uh, in the same time to be in some kind of the more or less uh, philosophical um, discourse about it. Absolutely. And that is one of the sort of the main functions of art throughout history. At least it has been this reflecting psychotherapeutic sort of quality that it has uh, making us confront uh, those things that perhaps drift out in the in the everyday. So thanks very much for this, Alexandra. Um, next, we move on to Bogdan. Uh, Bogdan, uh, could you please introduce yourself quickly? Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you here. Uh, my name is Bogdan Sviridov. I'm a Ukrainian uh, multidisciplinary artist. Uh, in my practice, I explore the uh, idea of time as uh, as an object. I try to make uh, people feel how time is go through, and uh, yeah, so I use it in my uh, lot most of projects. Uh, I work in both traditional and uh, digital uh, mediums. Uh, because uh, each of it ha has uh, its own uh, advantage because, for example, traditional uh, mediums give me some unpredictable things that I uh, uh, can't uh, uh, get in a digital mediums. Uh, for example, I, I started uh, uh, drawing digital paintings on my iPad and uh, it was really precise and really uh, uh, straight and uh, one time I uh, painted uh, a really big art piece and uh, used the uh, golden leaves uh, that contain uh, uh, Cooper. And uh, it uh, uh, started a re chemical reaction with the water. And uh, at the morning when I came to my studio, I uh, mentioned that uh, all the paint was cracked and uh, it could uh, fire up. <laughs> so. Uh, it was an unpredictable thing, but it look, uh, looked very uh, beautiful. And after that, I decided that uh, I, I will try to uh, uh, control the process uh, uh, really uh, not so, so, so straight. So, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. That's quite interesting. So uh, combining the digital and physical and how each medium has its own peculiarities. Um, and of course, as an artist, you uh, take advantage of them and try to use them for your creative process. Bogdan, in the beginning um, of your introduction, you mentioned that you work with time a lot. Um, so if you could perhaps elaborate a little bit more about that, because um, time itself is a very difficult concept that is not properly defined even in science still. Mm -hmm. So I wonder uh, what what interests you about it and then how you use it exactly. Yeah, yeah you're right. So uh, it's really a di difficult for, uh, idea uh, because it's uh, time is really abstract and uh, uh, anybody can't... Uh, uh, see it or feel it. Uh, we just mentioned uh, the time uh, only then. Uh, it, it 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 is a really small amount of time we have. So <clears throat> uh, uh, 
and um, for me and my project that always is some some feeling of uh, that it's, it's really uh um I, it, it's hard to uh to, to oh, sorry how to explain um Okay, so uh, in all projects, it's uh, always uh, some uh, light feeling of uh, uh, of that thing of time, and uh, I'm trying to show it uh, to uh, to another object, uh, something that people can uh, touch or can see or can uh, hear, and uh, so in that in that way they can. Uh, Feel that time is slow or time is uh, really fast. Uh, I have a few a few projects. For example, one of them is uh, uh, slow by by the sun, and I can explain a little bit about it. So one time I was in a village, and we go to a abandoned farm, and uh, when we came inside, uh, there was really dark, and uh, the uh, the air was. Uh, really dense and uh, uh, it, there was some feeling that you uh, uh, you are safe you you are hiding uh, hiding somewhere and you look from uh, windows outside and uh, I try to uh, uh, depict these feelings in a series of digital paintings that uh, show with uh, uh, feelings Fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, an interested party can learn more about you uh, throughout the internet and on VR's VR website too, because these are very exciting topics that you deal with. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much yeah. for, for joining us, Bogdan. Um, next, I move on to, to Ran. Uh, Ran, could you please introduce yourself too, please? Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Jai and uh, I'm a multimedia artist based in Vancouver, Canada. I mostly work with videos and large scale installations. Um, my art making is mostly research based and focuses on how individuals are entangled and abstracted within the politics of national identities and the capitalist mode of cultural productions. Um, I received my BFA in visual arts and art history from the University of British Columbia in 2019. And uh, in the past three years, I've had some solo exhibitions, about six um, in Vancouver, New York, and Paris. Also participated in some international group shows. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Ron. Um, so how has moving between China, Canada, and the United States influenced your artistic practice? Um, so I was born and raised in China and moved to Canada since I was 18. And then I worked in New York for a while as an artist after graduation. So I gained both an ideolog ideological foundation from East Asian culture at the same time, uh, deeply engaged with this Western-centric art system in North America since my undergrad. So such experience makes me to think out of the box. So at the same time, I care about how to deal with national restrictions, boundaries, and traditional concepts in my artwork. And also cultural hybridity is always the ground of my art making. So I'm always located in the gap between different cultures. So in this way, I don't have a sense of belonging to anywhere or to say I have a broader sense of home and cultural migration. So this provides me a more um, unique and personal way of artistic expression. Absolutely. And I think that it resonates with the broader theme of how art can help transcend uh, cultural barriers and boundaries. And so I think that your work and your life is a very good example of this. Uh, thanks very much, Ron. Um, why don't we move on to Cherry next? Uh, could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hello, my name is Shari Glogovac Smith. Um, I'm a composer, a vocalist, instrumentalist, uh, mixed media artist, and aspiring time traveler. Uh, I'm currently residing in Seattle, Washington, in the US. And uh, in my work, I seek to explore the counterpoint between uh, the human condition or humanity 
society and technology. And I do that through various mediums. Um, currently, I am working pretty heavily in moving image and also in sound. Thanks very much. Um, and so just to elaborate a little bit more about the last two topics that you've mentioned, uh, how, how does working in these different mediums uh, influence the output that you produce what does it what possibilities that it uh, does it uh, provide you with that um working in only one wouldn't yeah sure um well i think my approach is always coming from uh a point of i think healing um and uh holistic uh perspective uh, because my background initially was in health ecology so I, has, I have this kind of dimensional health dimension perspective that I bring to my work. Um, and so I center that in the middle and then I wrap things like uh, sound or uh, moving image around that concept and try to highlight how human beings are impacted in society. Uh, sometimes it's very critical and I'm looking at things like you know, race, uh, conflict um, and finding a way in which maybe we could explore in a speculative way um, or even in a more tangible way, um, healing in that. Uh, so I think it's a multifaceted approach and because it lends itself to um, multiple avenues, it allows for a deeper, I think more uh, effective landing in my art practice. Um, I really enjoy finding, or I think illuminating a world with sound and, um, and then moving image is kind of more direct. And so those two things together work seamlessly, I think, and I enjoy working with them. Right. And that's fascinating. And I think an overarching theme of these introductions so far, we clearly have uh, a collection of individuals who have had um, very unusual, let's say, uh, let's put it like this backgrounds, which perhaps have helped fuel the creativity that um, our visitors will get to witness uh, on at the fair. So thanks very much for this. And before we proceed to discussing the artworks in question themselves, I'd like to give the floor briefly to Anna, who has helped curate the exhibition that unites all of these amazing artists. So Anna, if you could tell us a little bit more about how you managed to tie together this collection of diverse individuals and these diverse artworks, that would be great. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, maybe it will sound a little bit crazy, but uh, the idea was really, what if, I don't know, tomorrow this planet uh, will not exist anymore? Uh, I was thinking to put together uh, the artists, art projects, uh, and uh, what we really need to show to aliens, what we really need to show to tell other planets, other uh, living creatures from other galaxies about this planet, about Earth. And that was fantastic because every project shows uh, the aspect of living of this civilization, about this mixed culture, it's about what we really appreciate in our life, what we really look for, the human memory, and all these topics. And I think, and I'm sure, if this exhibition will one day reach some other planets. I think that from uh, this 21 project, they will really understand who we are. Or maybe <laughs> this project will uh, stay in the history of, uh, of our planet. And maybe, I don't know, in, in five centuries after, after us, uh, new, generation will, new generations will find these uh, artworks, will find these projects that are very deep, that are very uh, beautiful and uh, they will also understand something about us. So it was like this crazy idea, this crazy uh, imaginary uh, transition between uh, our generation, our uh, time here on this planet and other planets and our, uh, other generations. That was the crazy thing. 
it's quite an ambitious <laughs> venture, but I dare say that we came close to to success of covering uh, the wide range of humanity's experiences in this art spaceship. So I would be curious to know what opinions aliens would have of us if all they received was this art spaceship. While that's a question, the answer to which I cannot provide yet, uh, we can move on into discussing the artworks themselves and learning a little bit more about what 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 was discussed in them so here why don't we start with arthur arthur so if you could tell us a little bit more about the artwork that our visitors may have the pleasure of uh, seeing at Kadaf, that would be great uh sure um uh, first of all it's a kind of a suite of works and uh, when i was working uh, on the digital art weeks festival for asia and different countries i noticed that when you move technologies through different cultures, you get different impressions because each culture adapts them and uses them differently. So the idea was kind of to pose myself a question is that how can I take a single idea and push them through all the known technologies that I know and want to get to know. So the first thing was to create two print works of it. And uh, those are a constellation artwork uh, where all the possible space artworks that are actually on the moon in outer space are have incinerated on their way back down to Earth or are just somebody's interest to put into space. Uh, they're all mapped there. And the other one is basically a rocket that takes you into the feeling of being put on a uh, kind of an art space platform, very much like the spaceship that Anna has created here for all of us. Uh, so those are the print works and they're actually interactive so if you load down uh, an application which is being used quite a bit which is uh, art of eva and you can kind of go along the poster and things come alive and pop out to you so it's kind of really nice uh, way to do it so that's exploring one element of the technology and then i moved into vr and create a sit and spin application using unity so you can kind of experience the constellation of all the artworks together in the kind of sit and spin situation and that's basically what you have in the, on the space art ship. And then taking this and moving into augmented reality, I'm doing some um, beta testing for Hooverly, which is a new platform for augmented reality, which I think is going in a great, great direction. So, and this way you can use your phone or any smart device to go into the, into the piece and kind of explore it. And now we're working on how to animate that and provide each one of the objects with the behavior so it's really interactive and, and moving around. But the whole idea was to get to the more newer versions of VR and AR, which are MR and XR. So, you know, a multi-rich kind of a media or taking something that integrates um, the environment into the augmented reality experience. For example, uh, Disney Lab was working a couple of years ago when I did an exhibition in Grand Central Station in New York that the behavior of the light outside of the augmented reality field would influence the contents of the augmented reality field. So you'd have real world signals influence the lighting of the augmented reality objects, which I thought was really fantastic. So that's basically XR. So I created a rocket ship, which is cut into plexiglass, which is actually a light module, light module, or light modulator, uh, which is very much like uh, the one Maholi Naj created, where it shoots lights in different fragments and textures and intensities. And so this sits in the room and goes all the way through. And basically, when you're looking through the smartphone and the AR app, these light fragments appear as stars shooting across the, the, the visual field. So you have a kind of an external physical world being integrated to a virtual world. So that was the idea of, of that thing. And then also historically, as Anna brought up, uh, what would we want aliens to discover about us? Now, it's really interesting to pose that question and to see how diverse artists have answered it over the decades. Andy Warhol th thought, well, they want to see what our dicks look like, right? So, but that was a smart thing because it actually tells the person looking at that what we call dick pic today is how we reproduce. So it tells a lot about human beings that reproduce reproduction systems. And then there's other artists who provided information, mathematical formulas to show how advanced we are. So it goes on and on. It's really quite interesting to see how um, or what people would like to communicate to kind of aliens or people or, or maybe the next generation in a million years, what we thought. Should there be a break in our history? 
which can actually easily happen. So it's about crossing over technologies in artworks and also about dreaming about what would we communicate to another species or whatever, by that simple way. But the whole point of the work was to kind of take a historical view, uh, introduce it in the present, extrapolate it into the future using the technologies to create what we call zero gravity space. Um, now, it's not a very ecological thing to put works in outer space. It's actually a bad idea. But uh, playing around with zero gravity is fantastic. And I think the space art ship does that in a very unique way. Because if we want to work with anemetamorphics or metamorphics or any combination of that, particularly animated or dynamic anemetamorphics, we need a zero gravity space to do it in. And of course, the new technologies in AR and VR and also the technologies we use to peek into those things like the mobile phone or the VR glasses allow us to enter that space. And so we can create three-dimensional sculptures which change depending on the perspective perspective or combine into new works depending on their combinations. So I think that's the whole idea of this work going through all the media and all the technology to get to that one zero gravity situation where you can kind of really feel free and expand and do what you want. What uh, a ravishing uh, combination of technology, philosophy, and just dreaming about the future. Uh, thanks very much, Arthur. Really well, very, very, very eloquent. Um, why don't we move to Shari next to explore our, I guess, vestiges of human civilization to be seen by alien, alien species. So Shari, what was your artwork like and what was it about? Sure, yeah. So my artwork is called the Afrofuturist Guide to Time Travel. Um, and time travel was kind of the central focus of it. Um, I've always been uh, inspired by the concept of time travel, uh, more in a, as a dreamer and um, a movie watcher. Uh, but it's something that's always kind of stuck in the back of my mind. You know, is time travel possible? Is it real? Um, and I was thinking about uh, Afrofuturism and uh, this concept of, of time travel um, in in context with each other. And uh, I, I stumbled across something called Black Quantum Futurism, uh, which is a theory that combines uh, quantum physics and Black African cultural traditions of consciousness, time and space. And it says essentially that, you know, the past and the future and the present are one and you can access them um, interchangeably um, or, you know, at the same time. Uh, and so I was thinking about that and, and how Afrofuturism exists, why it was created in our society um, as a kind of alternate reality, uh, because this one can be um, kind of tough sometimes, right? Um, how can we travel in space within that kind of framework? So what my artwork does is it, uh, combines machine learning with moving image and sound. So what I did was I took uh, various uh, Afrofuturist works, poems, um, theories, uh, writings, and I put them into a machine learning model called GPT-2. And it's a natural learning processing model. And I taught it essentially to uh, all of these kind of uh, texts, these theories, these words, these musings from all of the artists um, in the canon. And then I had to create what I would call future texts. Um, and so the future texts I saw to be kind of like a guide uh, as to how to access this concept of the future um, with the past in, in uh, being the kind of motive or the medium for that. Um, and then I took other elements of the past, like uh, found footage um, of, of, you know, uh, various images and of the present and put those things together along with a reimagining of what the sound world might look like um, and blended all those things together. And I think my hope was that it would uh, again, you know, focus on this kind of holistic idea, this healing um, element in a new way. So I'm always exploring, you know, these new uh, 
uh, relationships between technology again, sound, and um, how we can help humanity heal. And I think this this is an ex, uh, a good um, experiment in that. Absolutely. And uh, with an artwork like this, we're clearly just scratching the surface, discussing it in such a brief amount of time. And so I encourage everybody who is listening to this to go and check it out for the, for themselves. But clearly here, even the medium itself is more than just sort of a canvas in which you uh, which just ask, uh, acts as a host for the paint, but also sort of a co-participant in the creative process too. Uh, and so it helps to perhaps tackle such huge topics uh, that this uh, sort of philosophy of science and maybe history to Afro, that Afrofuturism is uh, captures. So um, the incredibly exciting, uh, my utmost commendations, and I'm sure I speak for everybody when I, when I give them. Um, so with this, I'd like to move on to, to Milos. Uh, to speak more about uh, the artwork that he brought to the art spaceship and to CADAF too. So if you'd like to tell us a little bit more about it. Sure. Uh, I was already, I already said something about it, but I'm trying to condense myself to be as short as possible. Otherwise, your guys are going to be in trouble with the time limit. Uh, yes, about about Deep Steel Fossil, um, uh, the, the, the core idea was uh, uh, individual and, and collective identity, and uh, it's a uh, uh, visual uh, leftovers and uh, Possibility to to create um, uh, to, to create some kind of aesthetic out of that out of that to, to cultivate that that sludge of, of digital material and, uh, and try to create the uh, some some kind of new aesthetic out. Of Also, in, in, in place of, of this concept, uh, this uh, evolutionary closeness of, of human and digital artifact uh, that uh, uh, we get used to it more and more every day, and uh, uh, progressively accepting that as a, as a part of. of uh, culture. Thanks very much, Milos. Um, with this in mind, I move on to, to Bogdan uh, to speak a little bit more about his artwork. Um, Bogdan. Yeah, my, my artwork uh, called uh, uh, Red Valley and uh, it started from a traditional, uh, from a piece of a traditional painting that I uh, feed to uh, artificial intelligence algorithm uh, to big gen. And uh, what I wanted uh, to see uh, how, it, uh, how we could uh, work together, how uh, algorithm see image uh, that uh, it's not uh, really objects, it's uh, just uh, some pattern of uh, painting uh, from, my, from my painting. And uh, when I got a result, I was really uh, uh, surprised because uh, in this uh, uh, pattern, uh, algorithm uh, saw some trees and uh, mountains and some valley. And uh, it was really uh, interesting idea because, for me because uh, uh, at that time I, uh, I mentioned that, okay, it, uh, uh, really same as uh, people uh, see uh, some objects uh, in uh, dust in some uh, dot and some lines in some uh, abstract things. And uh, I got further and uh, thought about uh, uh, about Mars, how, how people who never uh, have been at Mars uh, could imagine it. 
could imagine the surface of Mars. Now we uh, saw a lot of videos from Mars uh, uh, for, uh, because NASA show us, but the Soviet, uh, it was just our imagination. And uh, my pro project is uh, imagination of uh, artificial intelligence algorithm. Um, Thanks very much, Bogdan. Um, Samir, um, why don't you pick up? Well, let uh, let me uh, introduce my project uh, my uh, quickly. Well, uh, it's called Oasis Project. It's the Lunar Oasis Project. Why uh, did I pull it the Oasis? Well, uh, there is an intersection of three main driving forces in creating of this art piece. First one, uh, I do believe that the beginnings are similar. When we found, according to history, uh, an oasis or a source of water, human settlements usually start to crawl around and start to start life by drinking and then planting and then catering and then starting a new civilization. And I do believe that the beginnings are similar. And according to many studies, not only my own vision of art, but it's based also, also on facts that the same will start on moon. So I decided to take uh, a site which was a lunar cave and I reconstructed the site as accordingly as uh, many scientific uh, papers. So here comes art, my own interpretation of the scientific papers by creating the environment that will host my art project. Then I started by making a colonization in technical uh, terms. This colony is considered to be a, thir a third phase uh, settlement or a third phase colonization with a hybrid class kind of architecture, but away from the technicalities. Really, the interesting part is it is a new vision of uh, making a human settlement on moon, not an engineering human set, uh, point of view, but an, uh, an architect and an artist uh, point of view. I do believe that art is about creating new possibilities to various forms of life, not only human beings. We are importing in this settlement part of Mother Earth and uh, putting it on moon and this is the really interesting part and here when it comes really interesting that it, it turned the space that habitats from a machine for a living as engineers used to believe to a living organism that is interacting with its residents the uh, the the use of um, the main tools with the parametric design the generative uh, design uh, was, were used to uh, formulate and to generate the form based on the sand dunes, maybe the source of main source of inspiration and the oasis and the underground settlement that we found here on Earth thousands of years ago. That was the main source of inspiration. And then came the biomimicry. How can we really in turn this vision on Earth into a new different environment with a new different codes and, and uh, rules and physics and everything is totally different. But the main common thing between us is the human life form. So here came, came the human perception and the geometry. Also, you will find a circular formation with many dunes with a relationship that is, uh, as Leonardo da Vinci quoted, the ultimate sophistication is simplicity. That's that what applies on my project. It is a circle, but the circle, it is the silent language between us as an architect and artist and the user that might be using this kind of uh, uh, place uh, in the in the future, maybe in the near future, maybe I did estimation, a small estimation of this project. It might occur someday around 200 to 130 years from now. So it is a signing language. The circle is embedded and hardwired in our brains that it uh, reflects the unity, the 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 sense of community, the social imperative. We even use it in our words when we say the circle of family, circle of friends, circle of trust. So that was the main reason and main driving force behind using this circle. Also, it is a dilemma between engineering versus art. That was the really hard equation. This project had to really satisfy scientists and had also to satisfy artists. And that is the intersection between two totally parallel but different domain. And lastly, I would like to elaborate on something about art. What is art? Art is uh, uh, another word of beauty. We cannot say something is beautiful unless it is also functional. You see, that's the reason what we say when we say he has a beautiful mind. He is a beautiful person, not just an apparent beauty, but that means that it is also functioning and working in a good way and in a good manner. So Project Oasis is a very interesting project. I would like to invite you all to take a look at it. By the way, Project Oasis, you can uh, perceive it as an image. You can perceive it as a video. You can perceive it as a VR. And the really interesting part that I didn't reveal before, it could be 3D printed and you can have this artifact on your table someday. And if technology will permit us someday, you can really live inside it. 
Thank you. Perfect. Uh, how exciting. Thanks very much, Samer. Um, Alexandra, why don't you continue, please? Yes. So, so just like I told already before when I've done the introduction, so I'm very interested to put together physical world and digital world or just like a virtual world, better to say. And uh, the project started just because of the, my computer bug and uh, all my images that uh, I was watching the film Sleeper of Woody Allen. And all this film became like 99 images uh, and uh, just very strange soundtrack. And uh, it was so inspiring. It was so long time ago because it was like, I don't know, more than 10 years ago. So just, I really liked the idea how it looks like, but at the same time, I knew that it come from this film. So, but I start looking how to find the connection between the real frame and after to see what the computer proposed me like a version of the same frame. It was amazing. So next step that I was looking how, what I will do with this because I really didn't feel to throw it out. And in general, I like very much to work uh, on the rest of my work. So it means that I'm working a lot with the LEDs and the, after LEDs, I supposed to throw it out. But uh, after I use it, for example, for painting, light painting. So and for me, it was really not, I can't really throw it out. So just I thought, what I will do next? And I think, okay. Uh, it's very close to the tapestry and also all our digital work uh, world is coming more or less, we can say from the tapestry, from the first, uh, in, uh, from the first possibility to make uh, uh, witten in just the things. So, okay, so I just like, maybe I will do tapestry. And it was really amazing what I got because it was like uh, several filters, computer bark and after, uh, prints and after to see how it looks like in another object it's uh, but again it, it was like I think no just I need something because now uh, I'm in some sort of the strange puzzle what it is in general just it's not only tapestry because I would like to watch it for its beauty or some useful or not useful but I would like to know more about it and at that moment I start writing and this is like an in a sharp paint and this is there is no really end and there is no a, a really the beginning because this everything is going some sort of spiral coming on itself and continue to do development. So, uh, and I imagine that uh, in my case, I imagine in some sort of the human, but it's not human anymore. It's like 2000 later, we are just uh, read off completely from our body and we exist in like some sort of the energy sources. And they try to dig up the earth. And uh, yes, uh, sure, I was like most of the science science, uh, science fiction writers saying that uh, the earth was in some sort of the cataclysm, such a catastrophe, that they're digging up what they could from the civilization and they found this tapestry. And after I tried to proceed the process, like uh, archaeologues doing when they're trying to understand what does it mean, what part of the... Uh, uh, this object that they found, uh, how they can understand it and where they can put it and what kinds of their category. And uh, for me, it was uh, interesting for uh, work because I thought at the same time, people who, well, not people back again, non-human who will find something on the earth or they even find us that we can talk, but uh, they don't understand us. They will do some procedure to understand, to find some connection, trying to compare. And uh, for me, my work, it's some sort of the way how we can understand each other. So, and because of this, I thought it will be really great to have it in a spaceship. <laughs> no, it's quite fitting, especially since we sort of now look to the future to understand the present. Uh, previously, we had looking to the past to understand the present. So uh, we really are time travelers here. here. Um, with this in mind, I move on to Citron and Lunardi. Um, can I ask you to tell a little bit more about your artwork to our audience? Uh, our video, Back Up on the Memories, is a reflection about the cure preservation. Is it possible to crystallize the brain? Back Up on the Memories about the fear of losing memories and free fall of dining. So the fear of losing memories will become uh, the fear of losing data. At the same time, the video imagines a future in which the infinite digitalization and quantification of data has made information overloaded, starting a process of crystallization. Uh, we are no longer simple humans living together, rather 
we are humans being augmented by constant interaction with electronic device. Uh, according to post-humanist philosophy, the technology is not simply uh, at the service of the human being, but represents an ecological partner in the history of humanity with uh, which our species has begun and co-evolutionary relationship. Uh, this uh, co-evolutionary relationship is a work in progress. Uh, for more, is a post-humanist view. Uh, the technology never remains outside the body, but is always infiltrative, uh, as in backup of my memories. So we can say that uh, the cyber condition is uh, the, the proper to each human being. Thanks very much. Ran, would you please mind introducing your artwork? So my work is called uh, Doll Plus Body Transmigration in its Ideal Fantasy. It's inspired by my self-struggle, and I believe it's also many people's struggle with our standard of the perfect body. So our struggle be between the, the ideal and the real body is also a process of self-identification. It's reflecting a deeper aesthetic standardization defined and solidified by the society. <laughs> so this reminds me to link it to my previous installation, which uses um, thousands of assembly line plastic dolls to discuss the unified and abstracted education system. And uh, I start to have a strong will to push this and name and recognize a non-sexual doll to the virtual space and tell an absurd story of it. So this 3D animation short film stimulates a doll's perspective of, of its own self-recognition and transmigration of its body development. Um, in this film, the virtual world is a chaos located between 2D and 3D with many transcultural elements and references like video games, fashion culture, Western art history and Eastern ideology like Taoism, Buddhism, and so on. Uh, so this project presents body as a cyborg, according to Donna Haraway, that is a hybrid of machine organism a creator of social reality, as well as a creator of fiction. So the doll is us, we are just cyborgs, the condensed image of both imagination and the material reality. Um, and this concludes the series of, of, of interviews with the artists. And before we conclude the talk as a whole, I'd like to invite Anna to say a few words to a prospective visitor, somebody who is yet unacquainted with all of these artworks, what would be sort of your piece of advice for how to best go about learning more about this project? Uh, yes, thank you. I think that uh, one of the missions of this project is to make digital art and uh, media art closer to the audience, because I really think that we don't have any hope for politics or corporations and only artists and scientists can save this planet. So uh, I invite the audience, go deeper, spend time with every work, with every project, as far as every project is a deep, deep story that you need to go through, that you need to feel, that you need to see. So, uh, and you can do it actually on web version, you can do it in application, filling the, uh, the space and artworks with uh, your own body. So I really very proud of you guys, of artists, and I'm really uh, very happy for those visitors who are going to uh, explore this space, who are going to uh, to receive a lot of emotions and informations, uh, information and things to think about. Uh, and welcome, welcome to the art spaceship. Thanks very much, Hanna. Thanks very much, everybody. Um, this concludes this brief talk and the overview of the artists and their artworks featured at the VR booth at Cardiff Online. It has been amazing to talk with all of the artists, and we hope that this will help enrich the experience of those visiting the fair and deepen the understanding of these amazing works. All that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening in and that you can always learn more about these works in greater detail through our booth at the fair and at the VR website. We hope to see you out there on the pages of Cardiff Online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining.